When we last convened in New York, I spoke about the importance of comprehensive, planned, and national approaches to migration, not only as a nation-building tool, but also as an effective response to the challenges global migration can bring to all of us. This morning, I want to build on this by sharing with you how Canada tries to reduce and prevent migrant vulnerabilities and empower migrants to achieve positive outcomes and contribute to our society. I will speak to Canada's approaches at the international, bilateral, and domestic levels. Je parle de l'approche du Canada. I'll speak of Canada's approach uh, internationally, bilaterally, and domestically. Canada promotes the value of increasing regular opportunities and pathways for mobility, offering more regular, safe, and transparent opportunities for migrants to apply to enter another country, to reunite with their family members, to work, to study, or to seek protection, can curb the need for migrants to resort to irregular migration routes. We note that most migration, even today, takes place voluntarily and without incident. Yet increasingly we see conflict and civil unrest, severe poverty, starvation, and lack of opportunity and climate change as drivers of migration out of necessity. Desperation and a lack of available legal pathways compel them to embark on precarious migration journeys and sustain networks of smugglers and human traffickers. This can create or exacerbate vulnerability, opening up migrants to exploitation or abuse. Over the past two decades, more than 50,000 individuals have died trying to cross international borders. For those who, compete, or who complete their journeys, life in a new country is often full of un unanticipated hardship. They may face detention, violence, and exploitation, gender-based violence and abuse, stress and trauma, inability to attend work or school, health complications, discrimination, and xenophobia. These are just some of the challenges that large numbers of migrants experience on a daily basis all over the world. While we certainly don't have all the answers to these issues, Canada remains strongly committed to sharing the approaches that we have used and learned both those that have worked and the ones that haven't, in our continued effort to find ways to cooperate internationally to help migrants in vulnerable situations. In terms of our international efforts, multilaterally, Canada is engaged in the development of both global compacts. Our goal is to share and learn from others to promote concrete, actionable ways to address these challenges by calling on countries to strengthen their national governance on migration. This refers to the implementation of comprehensive migration systems addressing situations of vulnerability, protecting human rights, providing alternatives to dangerous and irregular movements, promoting inclusion, diversity, and the rule of law. Increasing opportunities for migrants to move safely and regularly will not only help reduce the vulnerabilities of migrants themselves, it will in the long term allow countries to reap the proven benefits of migration and work towards meeting the migration-related sustainable development goals of Agenda 2030. Second, at the bilateral and regional level, Canada is leading to advance national migration priorities, including our focus on the human rights of women and girls. In Central America, for example, Canada is working to address drivers of irregular migration by helping to provide at-risk youth with employment opportunities, strengthen child protection services, and violence prevention, and informed government leaders on the dangers and root causes of irregular child migration. In Haiti, Canada is working with the International Organization for Migration to prevent the trafficking of women and children and to better protect them, especially in border areas. In Southeast Asia, we are collaborating with governments, the private sector, and civil society to ensure that workers have decent wages and improved working conditions, and to provide information to prospective migrants on the risks of using smugglers and other modes of irregular migration. Across all of its work, Canada focuses on the rights of women and girls. 
Gender dynamics have important impacts on migration experiences. Women migrants make valuable contributions to economic and social development in countries of origin and destination. However, women and girls can be more vulnerable to physical and sexual violence and exploitation, trafficking, abuse, or marriage at a young age without their consent. They often do not have access to civil registration, birth or citizenship documents, are not allowed to pass their nationality onto their children in many cases, or may be an, unable to freely and safely access reproductive options and other health services that they may need. Last month, Canada launched a feminist international assistance policy through which we're investing $150 million over the next five years to help local organizations in developing countries that promote women's rights. This is a matter of basic justice, but it's also a matter of basic economics. We know that empowering women around the world makes families and communities more prosperous. Finally, at the national level, I want to speak to you about the targeted settlement and integration services that are provided by the Government of Canada to help all newcomers become successful in their new country. Canada's whole of society approach to immigration and integration is anchored in our multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, and multilinguistic citizens, citizenry. The result of Canada's history of welcoming generations and waves and waves of immigrants and providing protection to those in vulnerable situations. And as I said, when we last met in New York, Canada recognizes that our approach to migration can't simply be copied in other countries who have their own unique challenges and experiences. However, we believe that there are some, co some core common principles that could be adopted by other nations. The settlement and meaningful, effective integration of immigrants, in particular through schools and through places of employment, is something that we deem a priority in Canada. And we invest in, that, in those services. Uh, last year, we invested $664 million in the settlement and resettlement of all newcomers in Canada outside of Quebec. Uh, this year, we've increased that to $700 million. The settlement and meaningful integration of immigrants in particular in the long term drives diversity, which benefits the economic and demographic growth of our country. It benefits nation building, it benefits productivity, it benefits innovation and prosperity of our country. This is not simply a value statement that is advocated by our government. Rather, it is a sentiment that is widely supported by the general Canadian public. In Canada, all immigrants are seen as vital contributors to our economic prosperity and well-being. And the data shows that our citizens believe that the success of newcomers translates to the success of our country. In fact, the economic and educational outcomes of the children of immigrants are at par or sometimes exceed those of their Canadian-born counterparts. Through inclusive laws and policies, as well as real investments in settlement and integration services, multi-sectoral partnerships, our government helps to create an inclusive and welcoming environment to bring about social cohesion and public confidence in the country's ability to, to manage migration. But recognizing the value of migrants, recognizing the value migrants contribute to societies, provinces, cities, and organizations and businesses also improves understanding of cultural differences, reduces racial and migrant-related tensions, and can ultimately help to counter xenophobia. Our programs and partnerships have enabled the successful settlement and integration of migrants to Canada, and this has led to our high levels of public support for immigration in general. Integration is viewed as a two-way process requiring mutual adaptation by newcomers and by Canadian society. While it is incumbent upon newcomers to make the necessary efforts to be able to participate in Canadian life, it is also our society's duty to promote a welcoming environment that fosters the integration of all newcomers and ultimately their success. People will continue to move. We have to accept that. Countries can either try to stop these people from moving, or which we, we obviously know that if they do that, we, we fear will only drive these people underground 
and into the arms of traffickers and increase their vulnerability. Or we can all try to establish programs that will help newcomers and their societies benefit from the diversity, innovation, and other benefits of regular, safe, orderly, and well-managed migration. Canada therefore recommends, as part of inclusion or integration initiatives, enhancing services for the most vulnerable newcomers, including women, senior immigrants, and people from certain ethnic groups. These groups are more likely to face barriers related to low income, social isolation, poor health, and access to housing. To address these challenges, Canada's settlement programming funds a range of targeted settlement services that can be accessed by all newcomers, including women and youth. These services include mentorship programs, information and orientation of the rights and responsibilities of newcomers, employment supports, language classes, and family and gender-based violence prevention supports. In addition, we provide child minding and transportation services in order to ensure that mothers who may be the ones who primarily take on childcare responsibilities and, and feel unable to physically attend meetings or courses are able to do so and are able to access these really important integration services. This is a topic that is important to me, not only as a government representative in front of you, but is deeply personal. I arrived in Canada in 1993 as a young 16-year-old refugee from Somalia. And not like most newcomers to Canada, I had conflicting emotions. On one side, I was anxious about leaving a familiar territory and, and, and family and going to an unfamiliar country and society. On the other hand, I was uh, excited and hopeful at the opportunity to restart my life and uh, have access to new opportunities. And I must say that I remain immensely grateful for the generosity that, that I immediately experienced from day two of my arrival in Canada and the support that I experienced not only from the Canadian government but from ordinary Canadian citizens. And it is thanks to their warm welcome that I was able to feel that I belonged in this new society and that I was able to prosper and give back and ultimately run for public office. Immigrants are not only welcomed and embraced by Canadians, but they are encouraged to become active, productive members of their community and integrate fully into Canadian society. And although my story is not unique, it is, it is a unique country that can welcome someone and in just over two decades have them so integrated that they can run for parliament and become the Minister of Immigration, essentially lead the very department that they were once a client of. I think that speaks more and it speaks volumes about Canada than it speaks about me. In closing, Canada is committed to cooperating closely with the international community to develop a global compact on migration that is concrete and targeted towards key gaps that need to be filled in the way that migration is governed globally. Again, we believe that the focus should be on encouraging more countries to adopt comprehensive and planned national approaches to migration. Through the compact, Canada is also aiming to promote gender equality and address gender dimensions of international migration mobility. Finally, we aim to promote diversity and the inclusion of all migrants in host communities and countries. And far, nous nous efforçons de... Finally, we aim to promote diversity and the inclusion of all migrants in host countries. Included in the economy and life of their host community and country, they make many positive contributions. Lorsque les migrants... When migrants are included in the economy and life of their host community, they make many positive contributions. Term diversity benefits economic and demographic growth innovation and prosperity, and ultimately enhances nation building. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. I uh, cannot but recall that, uh, that part of the election campaign of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was a commitment that if elected, he would bring 25,000 Syrians to uh, Canada. But he was very clear they're not coming as refugees, they're coming as future Canadian citizens, which is the way to begin 
uh, your integration program even before they set foot on your soil. And IOM was very proud and pleased and honored to be asked to help examine these people medically, get them onto flights and bring them to Canada. I jokingly told Canadian television that, um, they said, can you do this in three months? And I jokingly said to them, well, next year's leap year. We have an extra day. Yes, we can do it. And in point of fact, the last aircraft actually landed on the 29th of February uh, 2016. So it's a, a great example, and I, I, as the minister has carefully pointed out, he's not suggesting that the Canadian model is for everybody. It's, uh, each situation is different, and they have to be adopted. But the lessons that they learned and the approach and the values that he outlined to us, I think, are all very, very pertinent. Uh, the whole question of meaningful integration, the fact that diversity is economically beneficial, the links uh, that contradict so much of, that they countermand so much of the current toxic narrative about migrations and coming back to an historically accurate reading of migration. All of that, I think, was implicit and explicit in the minister's message. So, Minister, I... Uh, Sorry to have had to run you back here for a third time to speak to IOM, but we are most grateful, and I think you all understand why it is that we so often ask the minister to, to speak to us. He's kindly agreed to, I know he has, he has another appointment, but he's going to try. Um, I'm glad to introduce uh, two uh, migrant voices in addition to that of the minister. Um, this is always a key session in every IDM uh, meeting. Uh, very relevant as we discuss migrant vulnerabilities. Um, therefore, consistent with our established practice of including migrants in the discussion, that I have the honor and pleasure of introducing uh, two migrant voices. First of all, uh, Ms. Uh, Fatimo Farah, uh, who has served as the director of the Himelo uh, Relief and Development Foundation um, since um, January 2008. The HIRDA Foundation, uh, HIRDA, is one of the leading migrant development organizations in the Netherlands, focusing on the link between um, both uh, migration and development in their home countries. Uh, she arrived in the Netherlands in the year 1992 as a refugee from Somalia. She was a university student when the Civil War began in Somalia and was able to finish her studies with support from the Refugee Assistance Fund in the Netherlands. And she's been working to advocate for the contribution of the mi migrant diaspora and refugees to their host country as well as to the country uh, of origin. I am. Um, also want to introduce Miss um, Monami Maulik, who's a migrant woman leader who has founded grassroots migrant organizations and advocated at all levels, local, national, and regional, uh, and global, for more than 15 years. She is the international coordinator of the Global Coalition on Migration, an alliance of migrant-led organizations, labor organizations, and faith networks. In her role, uh, Monami helps to coordinate the organizing of various civil society efforts to advocate for rights-based policies in the UN Global Compact on Migration process. From 2000 to 2014, Monami was the founding executive director of DRUM, the RUM, the South Asian Organizing Center, a migrant workers organizing center. She also serves as a board member of the U.S. Human Rights Network, the Center for Constitutional Rights, and the National Network for Immigrant and Refugee Rights. Ms. Malik has received the U.S. Human Rights Movement Builder Award and the Open Society Foundation Community Fellowship. So I want to welcome both of you here and thank you for coming. And Ms. Farah, the floor is yours. Uh, 
good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm honored to be uh, the voice of the diaspora of migrant. Actually, I'm still migrant diaspora refugee after 26 years uh, as a refugee in the Netherlands. And I, I recognize the, the, the voice of the, the Ahmed told now. I was uh, one of the refugees and I was welcomed and given opportunity to be the person that I am today. And I'm thankful to the government of the Netherlands to give me this opportunity. And if we, if we come back uh, to the vulnerability of, that, of, of migrants, of refugees, uh, I believe when uh, refugees are empowered, they are not more vulnerable. vulnerable. Uh, they are empowered and they, be, they can be the asset of the government, uh, the host country and the origin uh, country. So I choose one of the um, powerful quotes of a migrant, being migrant, and that is actually, if you, if you, if you go to the next, that is the, that's what we feel, actually. You are, you are in one part of the country, the host country, and the other part, you are the, origin, the country of origin. So you are between these two countries, and it can't be preached between two countries. You can contribute, you can contribute both countries. Um, so this is what I, I choose as a, as a quote of, of this, uh, this, uh, this uh, presentation. And I'm going to tell you what, what, is, uh, what, what has to be the voice of the diaspora for the next. And this is a picture. You, you are two parties in two different places. It's very, very powerful. You feel in a, in a country that you are hosting and the other, other country of, of, of you, the country that you come from. So, um, if you go the next. Um, I, if I told you a small my background, my background is already told, and I'm, I came here as a student, uh, 18 years, and I've got an opportunity to go to university, finish university, and get a master's degree of business administration for the Free University of Amsterdam. And, and that funding I've got from uh, refugee fund, uh, assistant refugee fund in the Netherlands. I'm very grateful to have this because I, was, I hasn't at that time any status, because I was not allowed as a refugee, and they give me that opportunity to finish my university degree. So that is, that is the empowering of that diaspora of migrants, of refugees, and I, I'm thankful of that. If I go back to the facts of the migrant, of diasporas, if you look at the SDGs, um, the contribution of diaspora is not much told but it is more about the rights and the, the other things. And I think that target is that actually a target for the contribution of the diaspora. The next slide. Uh, next slide. Um, I was like, when I, when I finished my university, I have a feeling to be part of, to give back my country because I have got a free university, free education. And I have that feeling that I have to do something back, but also the country that I am in, in the Netherlands. So I, I joined it after my study, on, and after five years of working as a business company, accounting company, I joined HIRDA. HIRDA is a diaspora migrant organization, and they started uh, feeling to contribute the country of origin. We started to build the schools uh, uh, from the funding from the diaspora coming from that region of Somalia. And 1998. Now it's 20 years, and we have done a lot of a lot of uh, projects, and uh, schools, and uh, empowering women, uh, leveraging remittance to development. Uh, we have worked actually the CPOs, and uh, and all of that it comes being a refugee or of being a diaspora because we know the culture, the language, and it is very easy to go there and work with the, with the other community. And, and you know where it's needed, actually, the, where you can do things. So we have offices in Somalia, UK, and Ethiopia. And we work that project. So you go to the next slide. If I come back to the, uh, the fact is of the refugees, of migrants, in 2015, uh, if you see, you see that almost 244 million is reaching the migrants. And you see that on, almost 65 million is displaced persons, it's 21 million refugees, 3 million asylum seekers, and 40 million internal displaced persons. But also you see that almost in 2015, uh, 601 
billion of, of remittance is going to the development country. Almost 73 percentage is going to the development, development country. So that is actually the, that is uh, three times more than development aid. And that is the contribution of diaspora, only the, if we are talking about the remittance. If you go to the next slide, uh, we see that SDGs actually, there is a target of SDGs. And you see that access and that there is a, there, there has to be increase of small, small scale industry. And you see that uh, remittance has to be reduced the transaction 3% and empower and promote social, economic and political inclusion and enhance the capacity to, to support developing, developing uh, countries. Those are the SDG targets regarding to diaspora. And that is also the fact is, and if you go to the next slide, this is, this is also a, a, a declaration and a recommendation principles of New York. And, and they, they uh, referred paragraph 46, 54, 69, all of them about the diaspora contribution and the commitments that the government has made. Mm -hmm. Also contribution of diaspora harnessing, strengthening links to the country of origin, civil society, private sector, those are the commitments and the, and, and, and the SDGs. If you go to the next slide, uh, we see that diaspora can contribute financially, and that is the remittances, but also social remittances. And that, what I mean social remittances is more about skills, technical ideas, advocacy, development project, investment. And if I took the country where I come from, if, if you look, the 80% of the SMEs are from the diasporas. And they're sending money, but also investing in the country. And if you look humanitarian and emergency assistance, the through 2017, Somali diaspora has sent almost a two and a half billion, a million to Somalia. And they contribute actually a huge. So uh, not only Somali diaspora, but also if you look to the other, 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 uh, other African countries, they contribute a huge. So I have some of recommendations, and if you go to the next, that is a challenge that we have as a diaspora organization. We work voluntary because uh, people are thinking, okay, they, are, they come from their country and they're doing something for their country. So it is more uh, uh, voluntary pace. Impact of remittance, when people send the remittance, there has impact of their family because they are sending money when they cannot send that money actually. Uh, diaspora initiatives are not coordinated. We have different diaspora initiatives and it's not coordinated. Lack of government support and partnership. There is no government partnership. Diaspora are coordinating themselves, organizing themselves. And there is no common voice of diaspora. Um, if you look to the leveraging remittance, people are sending home money, but it's not leveraging remittance. It's not coordinated uh, remittance and leveraging to development. And Sinovipia is also one of the things that diaspora are facing, or migrants are facing. So that's a challenge. If, I, if you go to the next slide, um, my recommendations are to uh, forfeit the SDGs, which increase diaspora impact before 2030 in order to reach the other SDGs, and create mod a modality to strengthen the role of diaspora and migrant association as development actor and cooperate with national and local authority to have a coordinated approach to the development. And develop diaspora policy that link the local and national level in a joint and uh, multifaceted approach. Next, next. Uh, the last is the last. Yeah. That is actually the, the, my recommendation is, and, and I hope that the government took this very serious to make the impact of the diaspora huge, and we are contributing the MDGs, and we can contribute SDGs if we get that, that space. So thank you very much. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Farr, and I'd like now to give the floor to Ms. Malik for her presentation. Thank you, DG Swing, um, and thank you to colleagues at IOM, member states, and civil society colleagues for inviting us to speak, and I um, thank the, the uh, organizers of today's IDM to encourage two migrant women who really demonstrate the agency of migrant women in leadership um, to, to be the representatives in talking about migrant voice. I also wanted to start off um, with a quick uh, quote from a very well-known Nigerian migrant writer named Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. 
She talks uh, very eloquently in a, her talk called The Danger of a Single Story, where she says that the single story creates stereotypes, and the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete. They make one story become the only story. I wanted to frame our discussion about migrant voices and migrants in the same way, that migrants are not a single story. Migrants embody many identities, many roles in society, as do all of us. For myself, I identify as a migrant, but also as a woman, as a policy advocate, as a grassroots organizer, as a feminist, and as do many migrants who share different stories and different examples. My story is similar and different to my sister Fatumo here. I migrated uh, as a five-year-old from Calcutta, India to New York City in the US. I grew up in a very racially diverse community in the Bronx in New York. Um, and I came as a migrant under different circumstances. My father came under a technical skills visa that was being offered um, to many uh, migrants from South Asia in the late 70s and early 80s. My mother came for her own reasons as a migrant. My mother came for economic opportunities, but she also came for the different opportunities that she had as a woman for herself and to raise a daughter in the US than in the society that she came from. And I saw my mother's journey in many ways lead to the place where I can be as a migrant, a woman who's been a policy advocate and leader speaking with you today. Um, and so I wanted to talk about, for me, what that has meant um, as, a, as a migrant advocate. 15 years ago, I chose to take the experiences that I have and start a grassroots migrant workers organization called DRUM, which is a South Asian worker center in New York City. So for many years, I work with migrants, mainly from Bangladesh, from Nepal, from Pakistan, also from Guyana and Trinidad and Sri Lanka, who are migrant workers, who are new migrants in the US. Many of the members, many of the communities that I worked in for, for the years were undocumented migrants. Most of the women and men I work with were domestic workers. They worked as construction workers, day laborers as retail and restaurant workers, as taxi drivers, the many men and women that we see in many global cities around us who are migrant workers and migrant families. And so for the years I worked in, in running this organization, my intention was that uh, we build the inclusion and the rights of migrant communities also through the participation of migrants in all societies. And so when we talk about social inclusion and we talk about integration, it's not simply the integration of migrants into language and into the cultures of their host societies, but understanding integration and social inclusion in the long term means also developing the leadership and the agency and the inclusion and civic engagement of migrant communities on various issues. And so this doesn't only mean as an organizer, we did not only focus on the rights of migrants, we worked for the rights and protections of migrants, but also with citizens, with nationals in the country that we live in for better education, for better housing, for better jobs, for all members of society. And as such, um, I wanted to just end off by saying that you know, we believe that migrants are not simply victims, as DG Swing had started us off in saying. Migrants are also agents of change and have great potential in all of the societies we are in um, to be parts of, of agency, of organizing. But this can only happen um, if we move forward towards a global compact on migration that will actually build the social <coughs> inclusion and rights of migrants, because the protection of rights of migrants is not about migrants ourselves, but it's about greater political, social, economic cohesion in the societies that we find ourselves in. Thank you. I wish to thank you both for sharing with us your very inspiring and personal stories. And I'd like to open the floor for your questions or comments. But let me start by giving the floor to His Excellency Minister Hussein, if whether he would <clears throat> like himself to take questions or to share any thoughts or impressions he has from what he's just heard. No, it's, it's, I'll take it's, questions. Yep. Yeah, take, take questions, OK? Uh, who would like to ask the first question? Uh, all right. Libya. Libya. You have the floor, sir. Great. Uh, okay. 
First of all, uh, it is uh, very important at the outset uh, to thank uh, so much Director General William Lacey Swain and his honorable organization for hosting such a great event. It's not something new and it's a long process which we do support and will be stand ready to uh, cooperate with this honorable organization. Um, actually, I wanted to uh, ask a question uh, or maybe uh, just a, a kind of a, a comment, a general comment, uh, towards what I've heard recently from the two speak the previously speakers and also uh, to the um, Minister Ahmed. Um, the first of all is uh, when we talk about vulnerability, uh, migrants, for example, when we talk about uh, children, disabled, and, and older persons, they are vulnerable by nature. But, when, it, but when, we, when we talk about adolescence, what I mean by that is youth, and that, and that counts, of course, uh, women, uh, boys and girls. When we talk about youth, they are not, uh, they're not all the time classified as vulnerables. There are times when they are classified as vulnerables, but there are times when they are not, especially when we talk about uh, uh, them being uh, fallen in the, in the hands of smugglers, human traffickers, sometimes they find themselves affiliates uh, to uh, terrorist groups. So they cannot always be classified as vulnerables. And I, I would like to remind you here that when we countered Daesh group in the city of Sirt, we found that most of them uh, were not Libyans, of course, and some of them were women. They even uh, turned to be explosives and they explode themselves, and the result was the killing of a number of soldiers countering that uh, terrorist groups. So this is when it comes to the classification of vulnerability of migrants. But Let's talk about a little bit about the uh, migrants in vulnerable situations. Some of the significant vulnerable situations is countries suffering from armed conflict. And here, uh, to allow, I mean, uh, you cannot throw someone dear to you in a, a, a place of hellfire and tell them, don't be burned, try not to be burned. This is this is uh, this is not rational. So to allow, uh, you know, vulnerable migrants to be in places where there, are, uh, you know, uh, fighting going on, or armed conflict, or proxy war going on, it's really not appropriate, and it's as if we are uh, pu trying to push them to be uh, to be classified as victims. And here. Uh, I would like to say to the uh, to, to uh, Minister Ahmed is that the model of, of Canada um, cannot always be applied in 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 in, in all countries. Uh, Canada has a great potential to receive, to provide, to protect, and also to benefit because uh, it provides shelter, it provides services, it provides provide all this kind of services that you might talk about. But don't forget that also migrants are contributing to the economy of a country like Canada. But countries who do not have these potentials, like my country, and I here refer to the visit that was done by the DG of the uh, Mr. Swing. We thank him so much for that kind of visit. Libya is suffering. Uh, I've been recently, uh, I've been to the capital visiting my family there, and we had no water. Imagine for weeks, no water in the capital. 
and the, the, uh, the health system is totally collapsed. You cannot provide uh, services to stranded migrants held in centers while at the same time you cannot provide them to your own citizens in the first place. So it's a comprehensive approach. It's a comprehensive approach. And we need to have a sort of a collective efforts in order to counter smugglers and human traffickers who are really the main, uh, they, they, they are really uh, sort of uh, consist of a grave violence for human rights of migrants. Uh, so it, the comparison, the, the, the comparison uh, to compare between Canada and other countries, it's too far, far beyond our imagination. Thank you so much. I'm glad that the ambassador agrees with me when I said in my speech that Canada's model is not always directly applicable as it is to other countries, however, uh, and also, I, I, I am thankful to the ambassador for acknowledging that Canada benefits from migrants. Uh, in terms of the vulnerability issue, uh, yes, there's degrees of vulnerability, but even for those who are moving for economic opportunities, that is something that we, we must recognize, that, that this will happen regardless of how many walls we put up uh, and so on. So I think the response to that uh, from our experience has been to put legal pathways for people to access our labor market on a temporary basis, year in, year out. And we've had 50-year-old agreements with countries like Mexico and Guatemala and Jamaica and, and others where, you know, uh, people come through those programs, uh, work temporarily in Canada, and then go back to their host, uh, to their country of origin, thereby benefiting not only their families, but their societies. And what we've found is that if people know that they can legally come, access the labor market, work temporarily, then go back and, and are assured that they have a fair chance of coming back next year, they will not abuse the refugee system, they will not resort to underground criminal networks to try to have irregular migration and they will not uh, overstay their visits because they know that and they have the confidence that they can come next year and work. And those programs have benefited those countries, those societies and those individuals and their families. And they've been able to make a little bit of money to, to support themselves. But it, those, those legal pathways to migration have also benefited Canadian society because these migrants uh, contribute to the labor market uh, they fill labor shortages and they contribute tax, uh, tax revenue to the government and they also contribute uh, socially and culturally to Canada. So uh, my simple point in my speech was that uh, the more legal pathways you can, you can have for people who are seeking economic and other opportunities, uh, the more chance you have to undermine the common enemy that we have, which is the criminal underground networks that are trafficking people and uh, preying on their vulnerabilities and their desire to improve their lives. Uh, and so that's, that's why we, Canada is very supportive of, the, of this kind of dialogue and on the Global Compact on Migration as a way for countries to coordinate a more global, uh, well-planned, orderly and um, and comprehensive uh, uh, process for migration, in, which includes legal pathways uh, to the labor market and other, other avenues of self-actualization for migrants. We can continue now with the uh, questions and answers for our two uh, migrants' voices. If you have questions, if you have comments, uh, please raise your flag. I just wanted to take this opportunity to uh, declare something. Uh, since uh, DG Swing, you have visited uh, Libya and you've seen some of the centers. Uh, there's a very, uh, very critical matter that I need to tackle here is we appeal to, the, uh, to the, some of the African countries who do have stranded migrants in our soil to help, 
to help us identify their citizens. Because there are, many, there are so many stranded migrants who are not identified by their own countries. They're not helping us to identify those uh, citizens to, uh, I mean, the, the countries to which they belong. So uh, we appeal to those countries who do have uh, um, uh, embassies in Tripoli to help the government of the national court to identify these uh, uh, stranded migrants. And for those who do not have uh, uh, embassies also to help with the collaboration with IOM to help identif identify these uh, uh, undocumented uh, stranded migrants. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. There are about 27 ambassadors in Tripoli, as far as I know right now. Perhaps others have joined since. It would be helpful to us also if we could get the support and assistance of these ambassadors and others who could come to identify nationals, because that would accelerate our process of taking migrants back home from the detention centers, those who wish to go. I can tell you that as of now, we have taken approximately 5,000 migrants back voluntarily from Tripoli, in addition to about 3,000 from our uh, way station in Agadez, Niger. And there's a lot more, though, of people who are really need to go home and wish to go home, and it would help if we could identify who they are and give them some basic travel documents. So I support your point. Um, are there other questions, uh, other comments? If not, I want to thank our two Migrants' Voices. You've covered it very well, obviously, and very comprehensively. Thank you very much for, again, uh, helping us to continue this tradition of hearing from migrants directly. And I wish you all the very best uh, in your work and hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much.